Hello, listeners, and welcome to another episode of Cognitive Dissidents. As usual, I'm your host. I'm Jacob Shapiro. I'm a partner and the director of geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments. Joining me on the podcast is Ruben Steff. He is a senior lecturer at the University of Waikato. He's currently on sabbatical right now, enjoying a year in the Czech Republic. Uh, Ruben and I have been circling each other on Twitter for over a year now, trying to find the right time for a podcast and kept on dropping the ball. But we finally got together uh, to offer a New Zealand perspective on geopolitics and global affairs. Um, I thought this was a terrific episode. It was looking at things from a different angle. And Ruben is also just a great sport. So Ruben, thanks for making the time. We will certainly have you back on the show. Um, Listeners, same thing as usual for me. If you want to talk about CI's wealth management strategies or the research that we offer to institutional clients, email me at jacob at cognitive.investments. If you haven't uh, rated or reviewed the podcast, uh, it takes just a couple seconds of your time and it's immensely helpful for us to, to, to rise the ranks of that algorithm and get more people listening to the podcast. So if you haven't done that already, please consider doing so. Otherwise, enjoy the episode. Cheers and see you out there. Cognitive Investments LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Cognitive and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. For additional information, please visit our website at www.cognitive.investments. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and it should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security. It does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult your attorney or tax advisor. All right, Ruben, it, it's so nice to have you on the podcast. Our top four countries for listenership are the United States, 44% of listeners, Australia, 7%, the UK, 6%, Canada, 6%. Uh, I have to get to page three of my data over here to actually find New Zealand on here. You're getting outbeat by countries like Sweden. I've got double the amount of listeners in Denmark that I do that I have in New Zealand. And having you on the podcast wow. is part of the reason to fix that. Nice to have you here. Awesome. Great to be on, Jacob. Um, We've been talking about this for a while, so really happy to be here. Um, First of all, tell the listeners who you are and uh, and where you're broadcasting from. Sure, simple. Um, Look, I'm an academic from the University of Waikato in New Zealand. Um, Currently researching things like great power competition, small state theory, emerging technologies, and so on. Currently in the Czech Republic. Been here for about a year on sabbatical because my wife is Czech. I always promised her we'd come and live and spend some more time here than just one month a year. So here we are. It's a a great little country, interesting part of the world to observe developments and um, things that happen in Europe definitely are more real when you're here. You know, like you might recall when that um, missile fell into Poland or maybe it was a um, Ukrainian missile defense Mm -hmm. missile went into Poland. We were literally on the border of Poland at the time because that's where my wife's family live in the Czech Republic. So in New Zealand, normally that would be significant, but not an immediate thing for me. But being on the border, you suddenly look at the news and go, oh dear, if this escalates, we're on the front lines of something. So you definitely change your your framing and lens of things when you're here. Well, yeah, that's a great sort of segue into this conversation in general, because you basically have no borders. You don't share borders with anyone except a large amount of ocean. And I know that there's a lot of concern about China and the South Pacific. But, you know, even if we're even if we accept that China is this revisionist power that's expanding all over the world and listeners know, I don't think that I've had guests on the podcast who have that point of view, Uh, you know, but that's many island chains in the future. Many You'd have to do many, many nine dash lines like exponentially to the point where China starts threatening New Zealand. So it must it must really be a kind of a different thing. And I, I guess one of the questions I wanted to first ask to you is, should New Zealand really care about what's going on in the rest of the world? I mean, things can go crazy all around the world. And I mean, and things really wouldn't affect you in any meaningful way just because of where New Zealand is on the map. So what what is the argument for New Zealand to pay such close attention? Because it seems to me you could just close up shop and take care of your own and not have to worry about the rest of the world. Yeah, sure. Like, to your point, New Zealand is sometimes called a dagger pointed at the heart of Antarctica. (laughs) You know? Um, So why does New Zealand care about the world? I mean, you can start from that idea that globalization has kind of shrunk geography to some degree, um, that you know, that in the past, the, the tyranny or the blessing of distance really kept things away. But now New Zealand has to worry about, well, global supply, trade routes, has to worry about cybersecurity concerns, has to worry about ideological viruses coming through social media and then leading some Australian guy to come over to New Zealand and <laughs> kill 50 or so Muslims in yeah. Christchurch, which which you know, happened a couple of years ago quite tragically. Yeah. 
but it's also legacy, it's historical, it's cultural. I mean, New Zealand was one of the, the, the new Europe's, one of the little Britons that came out of the British Empire. Our history, really until the 20th century, um, New, New Zealand's a fairly young country too. You can probably maybe trace our modern founding to about 1840. But until the early 20th century, New Zealanders just saw themselves as little Britons. You know, we were the little Britain in the South Pacific. We were unthinkingly allied with the Brits. We weren't really even independent. Our military was, uh, you know, seen as just enmeshed with the British military. We went off and fought the military war, uh, the British wars in South Africa in World War One and World War Two. We went off to wars there as well. That then transitions away from the British security umbrella to the American security mm-hmm. umbrella in the early post Cold War period. Sorry, the early Cold War period. Um, and look, then we go off to Korea, we go off to Vietnam, uh, we also play around in Malaya with the British still for a while. So there's this legacy, right? There's this history there of us being a kind of a Western country. The current conception of New Zealand, national identity, is slowly changing. There is kind of a national, a nation building process underway there. Um, but by kind of culture, by economics, until quite recently, we were symmetrical with our close British and American and Australian friends and allies, right? So there's that legacy there. There is increasingly as well, uh, despite what you say about, hey, why doesn't New Zealand just bow out? Uh, There's some of those impulses there, and I'll come back to that. It's because, you know, we are reliant on the rules-based system, right? Now we can quibble, is New Zealand reliant upon just a rules-based system, or is it specifically a liberal, you know, Mm -hmm de facto kind of American-led rules-based system. We need that system to work well because we're a small country. If predatory powers get away with the aggressions, if there's a cascading series of events, you know, say Russia swallowed Ukraine in a week, and maybe a few years from now, or less, or hopefully a lot further away, who knows, China then makes a move on Taiwan, and these countries are successful, there isn't uh, costs and punishments imposed, well, then eventually we could get to this kind of worst case scenario 10 years from now when the spheres of influence are expanding ever outwards and suddenly Australia and New Zealand are threatened by some predatory state states. And again, this is another, there's a historical maybe pathology here for Australia and New Zealand. Um, in World War II, right, the Japanese expanded all the way into the South Pacific. You know, had the US not come into the war or had perhaps the attack on Pearl Harbor being more successful, it's not inconceivable that Australia would have been invaded at some point. And once you have Australia, New Zealand is just you know, a fruit, the bottom of the tree you can pick after that. So, yeah, there are these considerations. I think there is, there's been a long and a, a desire for New Zealand to be a good international citizen, but also kind of a good ally and partner. And maybe you have to ensure you're willing to try uphold the existing rules-based system because it, it benefits you. It's, it's the guarantee of New Zealand's long-term survival. And that is coming through more and more in New Zealand's official strategic documents and statements by prime ministers, the Minister of Defence, and so on. Yeah, and, and that's a good place to pick it up because I, I wanted to ask you or at least a New Zealand expert this for a long time because, um, and listeners may not be aware of this, but there's a treaty called the ANZUS Treaty, which was supposed to be a trilateral defense treaty between Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. I believe it was 1951 or somewhere around then is when it was signed. 51, 51 to 86. 51 to 86. And in 86... For New Zealand. For the, for the New Zealand US part of it. The Australia US part of it is stored at it. Well, and th- that's sort of my question because from 86 until the 2010s, New Zealand and the United States really aren't on the same page at all. And I wonder if they're still on the same page because uh, it's it's one of the few areas of real strategic ambiguity, I feel like, in U.S. foreign policy. One of them is Taiwan. Is it a country? Is it not a country? Will the U.S. defend it? Will it not defend it? But this, I mean, obviously, New Zealand is a country from a U.S. perspective, but would the United States defend it? Is a defense treaty sort of in place? I know that there have been strategic declarations from the New Zealand government over the last 10 years. It says, oh, no, we're a strategic partner with the United States. There have been investments in military. New Zealand certainly behaves as if it's in the five eyes and is part of the club. But technically, on paper, it's not part of the club. Um, do you think it will be? Do you think that matters? Like, how does that, um, I guess, how does that work in sort of New Zealand's strategic framework for thinking about the world? Yeah, so it's a, it's a tricky thing to look at, but just so your listeners know, in 1986, the Reagan administration, through an executive order, suspends its kind of security commitment to New Zealand 
because New Zealand had an anti-nuclear policy where we would not allow nuclear-powered or nuclear-armed vessels into our territory. So therefore, the US Navy could no longer come into New Zealand's territory and the Reagan administration said, okay, too bad, you're out. Now, that did lead to a downgrading of some diplomatic um, linkages, military linkages. I mean, New Zealand didn't trade with the US military after that until the 2010s, I think 2012 onwards. From what happens from 2010 onwards is we do get a change of government in New Zealand. The John Key, a national conservative government, comes in. And we get these declarations, the Washington Declaration and the Wellington Declaration. And that's to increase our cooperation in the Pacific and also to start increasing military ties once again. I mean, not that military ties were, ties were dead to that point, but to start um, re-energizing the military relationship. Walking forward from there to now, I mean, New Zealand is arguably a de facto ally of the United States once again. Uh, we purchase a majority of our military equipment comes from the United States. We are rolling out these big P-8 Poseidons, right, that we'll maybe touch upon a bit later because that, that plays into the whole submarine competition in the Indo-Pacific mm-hmm. and what's going on with AUKUS in Australia. We um, have a memorandum of understanding with the U.S. on space cooperation. We're part of the Artemis Accords. We joined the U.S.-led Shreva Space War Games. Rocket Labs, which is a Kiwi-American firm, sends satellites into space now, some for U.S. military purposes. Um, U.S. officials have also sometimes, in the last few years, referred to New Zealand as not just a close friend, but an ally. Now, that is rhetoric. Okay, if you do not have, I think, the bilateral security agreement, you cannot be fully assured, even if you can be fully assured if you do have the agreement, but (laughs) but without the agreement, irrespective of the rhetoric, yeah, would the US come to New Zealand's assistant in a kind of conflict situation? It's not guaranteed, it's not certain. New Zealand would say, well, I guess New Zealanders would think, well, yeah, but look, we're de facto protected by Australia and the US, right? Australia is this giant continent-sized barrier to Asia. Anything that has to come to us is probably going to come through Australia first. And then, you know, if there's going to be a fight, perhaps we would try help the Australians defend their borders because we know we're next. Now, I would just say back in World War II, one of the arguments New Zealand officials made to US officials for why they should... um, use New Zealand as a base of operations to fight into the South Pacific is because of the argument of, hey, look, maybe the Japanese at the time outflank the Australians and they take New Zealand first and then you can attack Australia from the east. Mm. So there is this very worst, worst case scenario where New Zealand could still be seriously undermined without Australia falling first. But we do not have that bilateral security treaty and that's a fact. And New Zealand is actually comfortable with that to some degree. I don't know if we always will be. And partly that gets into this idea of New Zealand having independent foreign policy, which we can unpack a bit more if you want. But because of our relationship with China, because China takes about 34% of our exports, uh, Australia is next to about 15%, there is this desire in New Zealand to ensure we can always have some measure of separation from the rest of the Five Eyes and the broader Western Alliance, if you will. On many things, actually, there will be no separation. But we have to keep finding ways to show China that we are not fully in lockstep with US strategy in the region. Because then Australia, sorry, China can look around and go, oh, well, you know, the Kiwis, there's a measure of difference there. And they seem to respect and potentially reward that. So that's one reason why I think New Zealand is actually happy with, as yet, not having any new treaty or having the ANZUS reestablished. Because it would just take Joe Biden to wake up tomorrow and decide to you know, do a new executive order to um, reactivate the ANZUS Treaty with New Zealand. Yeah, I feel like a New Zealand lobbying group could probably get it done in the, in the span of, of maybe a year or so. But in some ways, New Zealand is also the trendsetter here because you know, if we were talking two, three years ago before the Albanese government in Australia, I would have described Australia as probably the most hawkish country in the world when it came to China. And suddenly with this change in government in Australia, Australia is not the most hawkish country in the world when it comes to China. We're hearing, you know, talk of multipolarity from their uh, foreign ministry. We're talking about Australia-China trade starting to pick up again. And to your point, uh, this is where security and economics and trade really dovetail because New Zealand can say that it's part of the U.S. security-led alliance all that it wants. But as you said, economically, 
30, I think it was 34% of exports. Most of that is also dairy products. And I don't know if you have any dairy expertise, but there actually is a little faction of dairy listeners um, on this podcast who always ask me, well, what's happening with New Zealand? Because they look like they're going into secular decline because there's all these ESG things and they don't want the cows and the cows. Anyway, we can get to that in a second. But so not only are you dependent on China for exports, you're also your main industry is one that maybe is not going to be the main industry in 10 years. And I'm not sure what's really going to pick up for it. But the, the question that I'm leading up to there is, um, do you think Australia's sort of seen how New Zealand has played this over the last couple of years and wants to have its cake, or in this case, its coal and its wine and its beef sent to China <laughs> and eat it too? Because New Zealand really has never, you know, despite some of these moves with the, you know, the military in the United States and um, some of the objections that New Zealand has made to some of China's moves in the South Pacific, correct me if I'm wrong, you've never really had or you've never really felt the full weight of China like it did with Australian coal exports or like it did with Canadian canola exports. New Zealand has been able, able to preserve a more pragmatic trade relationship with China in general. Yeah, look, that's ab absolutely correct. And there have been wobbles in the New Zealand-Chinese relationship. The Chinese are not shy about sending signals to New Zealand. You know, New Zealand joins... Um, you know, some naval patrols in the Indo-Pacific and Chinese state media will, will say something explicitly like, be careful, New Zealand. You know, like they, these, <laughs> these messages do get down to us. There's been some industry controversy at times as well where New Zealand businesses in China have kind of been threatened maybe by sort of state officials or mm. individuals aligned with the state that, you know, where there's plausible deniability and so on. But that is a concern. That is a motivation. Uh, this is explicitly talked about in the New Zealand media, um, not frequently, but not infrequently either, that you know, New Zealand has to be a bit careful here, lest we lose a big chunk of the trade relationship with China. And overnight, we have farmers committing suicide and things like that. I mean, it's not outside the bounds of possibility. Are we trendsetting for Australia? I mean, the Australians would never admit that for a start, but setting that aside. Um, what's interesting here is that you know maybe we separate out separate out Australian rhetoric from reality, if we do start to see a real tangible improvement in Australian-Chinese relations in the coming months and years, then okay, maybe something's happening there, but it, it may just be the Australians having a Labour government now, uh, like New Zealand has a Labour government, uh, uh, trying to rhetorically you know, um, reduce tensions a bit. Maybe things got a bit out of hand and they do want to restore some of that trade that was reduced. But I think the weird thing now is that New Zealand might be becoming a little bit hawkish, more hawkish, than actually even the last few months. So maybe there's a thing where the Australians realise they've gone a little bit too far and they're looking to take a cue from New Zealand. There was a bit of a controversy last year as well when some New Zealand officials said to the Australians, you should learn to treat the Chinese with a bit more respect. And that led to Australians saying, hey, you know, come on, New Zealand, um, interfering in our domestic affairs and so on. Uh, but we now have a new leader in New Zealand, Chris Hipkins, Jacinda Ardern, the former prime minister. She stepped down. She'd, she'd had enough. She'd had, a, I think, a pretty stressful time of it. We have a new guy, Chris Hipkins, in, who so far is basically continuing the same line as Jacinda Ardern, which is this kind of, you know, we want to be friends with everyone, concerned about the rules-based order, but concerned about China's activities too. But we have a new minister, minister of defense who's come in with him, and he is taking quite a, a tougher line in rhetoric. And we can anticipate potentially in substance in the months to come because there's a defense review that will be coming out in New Zealand in the next few months. There's going to be a force design review. New Zealand's first national security strategy is also going to be coming out. Hmm. So it's possible some of the rhetorical signals we're seeing from our new minister of defense is going to translate also into new practical military acquisition decisions as well. Um, so I think, yeah, maybe the Australia is taking a bit of a cue from New Zealand, but we, I think, are probably taking a little bit of a cue from them and the Americans as well. Well, and it's it's remarkable that you say that because uh, I'm just looking at some of the polls here, and it looks like looks like Hipkins has been good for the Labour Party. The polls seem to be uh, heading in his favour for the first time after kind of a steady decline there for a bit. But if the Labour Party, I would expect that the Labour Party would be the one that would most be most skeptical when it comes from a security position. But if you're telling me that like the the skeptical sort of dovish position is, hey, we need a national security strategy and we're going to have all these sorts of things. I mean, it sounds like New Zealand is pretty well locked in place. I know that elections are coming up in October. Um, what is at stake there for New Zealand's foreign policy and security strategy? Or is it is there really just kind of broad consensus from a foreign policy perspective across the political parties? And that's more domestic inside, well, I was going to say baseball, but 
wh- whatever sport I should use in that metaphor. Let me know. Sure. So foreign policy almost never becomes heavily politicized in New Zealand to the point that it can actually have an effect upon an election. Probably the last time might have been the invasion of Iraq. And even then, I don't know if it affected the election, but it was definitely um, erupting in New Zealand's domestic political environment. Well, I suppose to add a little bit more complex and context to what I was just saying, what is interesting is our Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade, her approach is quite different to the Minister of Defence. She is... You're pushing forward. The, 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 this is kind of the typical New Zealand rhetoric and foreign policy. We you kind of throw everything at the wall, right? You <laughs> you always throw enough information out there. You write these grand speeches where you're kind of friends with everyone, but you're also concerned about some things. And it allows every country to go, oh, well, New Zealand says these things we don't like, but they also throw us a bone over here. Um, and she has been trying to bring in a, a kind of more unique, some might say post Western. Um, kind of indigenously influenced view of the world. And part of that might be to try appeal to the South Pacific nations, right? These these are nations that are critical to our security. Uh, these are nations which we have familial, cultural ties to. And there's a Polynesian shared heritage between them and the Maori indigenous people of New Zealand and that part of New Zealand's national culture that's really being brought more to the forefront a bit more in New Zealand's politics these days so some of that rhetoric might be about that about a kind of south pacific farm out or family but if this is election i think what might be occurring is there might be a division in the new zealand cabinet between perhaps dovish factions and more hawkish factions and we're going to be careful here even new zealand's most hawkish factions are not going to be like hawkish factions in the u.s or australia i think but nonetheless we are talking about potentially significant changes in policy um but one area that I'm sure we'll talk about will be AUKUS. Uh, New Zealand has probably been invited into pillar two of the AUKUS trilateral security agreement, but we're punting on it, okay? We are punting on it until after the election, I think, because this government, like you say, Chris Hipkins is doing okay right now. Why rock the boat at all on any aspect of foreign policy when that foreign policy can be highly resonant with parts of the New Zealand public? So kick the can down the road for now, perhaps position yourself, keep an eye on the environment, see what happens next. I mean, we might be seeing a lessening of tensions between the US and China, maybe even a kind of temporary detente breaks out. And then New Zealand, come a year from now, come the election, has you know, different options. Doesn't have to ha- perhaps tack so much towards a hawkish direction or you know what have you, whatever option is uh, ultimately considered but we're kicking some things can some cans down the road right now i think there's the potential though for civil society and people like me in the lead up to that election though to to turn some of these issues into political issues because they can quickly resonate in a small country of only five million people yeah um from a new zealand perspective do you think there is a a real chance for a u.s china detente i know you said that and i know biden's been talking about the thaw from your perspective is is that real at all because i mean even as an american here i'm extremely skeptical and think biden's about five years too late if he wants to get that horse back in the barn but look i'm skeptical too of it being of any real substance but when i look at taking off my new zealand lens here when i look at it from a geopolitical point of view I feel like the Chinese need some time. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the Americans just sewed, sewed up their alliance system. The Philippines, uh, Papua New Guinea now. Yeah. Um, if you're the Chinese leaders looking out of the region right now, what do you do? The, the first island chain is secured. The second island chain is basically secured. Even in the little old South Pacific that you thought you were making some headway, you got the Americans coming back in. New Zealand's going to sign a status of forces agreement with Fiji soon. Australia are signing agreements. Um, so if I was them rationally I would think maybe we need to really find a way to buy time to reassess our strategy to get our economic house in order and if we can get you know go up a gear from here then we can really begin the the pushing out the influence in an assertive way once again so is the detente likely I don't think so in any substantive way maybe there'll be time for some you know discussions and maybe they'll put together some stabilizers maybe some arms control agreements who knows some some small things that everyone seems to be hoping is put in place because if there's a new cold war 
they'll be able to be on a better platform to manage it. But I, I think I agree with you. I think the horse is bolted on the most significant aspects of it. Yeah, although for all I know, with, with the news flow about UFOs and aliens here in the United States these days, maybe we're about to do Independence Day and China and the United States will join together in a in a in a battle against our alien our would be alien overlords. But I um I want to underscore. Oh, do you have something to say about the alien overlords? Oh, this, this, oh, look, I'm, I'm a you know look when you're in this field, you you do think these bigger thoughts. And one thing is always this idea of hey, if there's an external threat, the whole world will unite. Um, may, maybe hopefully, even Ronald Reagan talked about this. But have you seen the movie Arrival? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I quite like sci-fi like that too. That complicates it even more and shows that maybe all the humans will not unite. I like to think we will, but you never know. Oh, we we definitely will not. I mean, th- I think Three Body <laughs> Problem is the best like novel ab- or about this. This I think the Chinese have the the right perspective there. Um, and I, I I wasn't even taking the UFO stuff seriously, but Matt Pines, who comes on this podcast sometimes, he he has me actually paying attention now. I I, I hate that now I have to pay attention to this UFO stuff because my instinct is that there's a mass hysteria here, but that's not uh, where we wanted to go. Um, I wanted to underscore what you said about. China's interest in the South Pacific, because if we, as we, as if we had had this podcast like we planned around this time last year, we probably would have been talking first thing about the Solomons and China, and there's a security agreement, and China's taking over the South Pacific, and they're going to do an end run around, you know, uh, the first and second island chains. Everything's going well. Um, since then, uh, things have not gone well for China, as you alluded to. They thought they had a deal with the ten South Pacific nations, blew up in their face. Now there's some reports that they're trying to increase trade. Um, you know, with some of these nations, and they're going to have some kind of economic trade deal. But the United States, Australia, and New Zealand seem to have really gotten the South Pacific on board with their vision uh, of kind of the world, which was surprising to me. I would have thought those nations would have been more interested in the economic and trade benefits that China could offer, rather than the rhetoric and sec- rhetoric and security concerns coming out of New Zealand and Australia and the United States. But it seems like, like um, you know, the English-speaking countries have done well in the South Pacific. How do you account for that? And do you think that that is a substantive change? Does New Zealand see success there, or is or is there still a chance for China to try and um, seize defeat, or excuse me, seize victory from the jaws of defeat? Sure. Well, this is probably where it's helpful for your listeners to pull up a map of Oceania, so they yes. can see these small micro nations in the South Pacific, these island states. Um, so I'll just put that out there. Look, decades go by where nothing geopolitically relevant happens in the South Pacific. There, there are local concerns, you know, sometimes local conflict or coups or tensions, but the last couple of years, things have changed quite a lot and seem to be seem to be changing in, a, in China's direction until relatively recently. I think what's happened is, you know, China has, it, its aid in the region has increased its diplomatic profile. I mean, it has more embassies in the South Pacific than the United States does, they might surely change because the US are opening up new embassies and so on. And, you know, they, they have investment, they have infrastructure in the region, and they could come into the region for quite a long time as well and kind of say, hey, look, you know, we are a developing nation too. We want to help developing impoverished nations, just frankly, you know, rise, common destiny, common vision and all those things. And, you know, the Australians and New Zealanders take you for granted. And, you know, they're neo-colonial powers or what have you. And I think that did resonate for somewhat, for some time in parts of the South Pacific. And there was a perception, I've heard this from American commentators, that New Zealand and Australia dropped the ball, right? That this sphere, you know, the, the Pacific used to be considered the American lake. And the South Pacific surely is like a kind of pocket of that lake and should be completely locked down by the New Zealanders and Australians. But there's been criticism that we dropped the ball. Uh, maybe we did, maybe we didn't. But I think... What I would say is that, you know, for a long time, New Zealand was on symmetrical with the Americans, with you guys. We were engaging China heavily. You know, there was this mm-hmm. idea that if we just hugged them, eventually they would liberalize and so on. And that hasn't happened. Uh, you know, America also went off to the Middle East and wasted decades of time there and took us with you, by the way. Australia and New Zealand went into Afghanistan and Iraq. And so maybe we all took our eyes off the ball of these kind of vulnerable regions and the Chinese had a free hand to push themselves out. But yeah, speeding up a little bit to recently in the Solomon Islands, what happened in April last year is they signed a kind of security agreement with China that allows routine port access to the Chinese Navy. It also apparently will allow uh, 
Chinese law enforcement to train Solomon's law enforcement and so on. There are meant to be elections in the Solomons this year, and that's being put off until next year. The Solomons government said it didn't have the funding to hold those elections, so it's put them <laughs> off. So some people are saying, okay, there's, there's, there seems to be a connection here, right? China makes an agreement, increases its influence, and suddenly democracy starts to, um, you know, um, vanish. But that agreement also followed riots in Honiara, the capital of the Solomons. And those riots targeted Chinatown, Chinese interests, for a whole host of reasons. There, there is a bit of great power politics playing out here, where the Solomons shifted its recognition from Ty- from China, sorry, 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 from Taiwan to China a couple of years ago. But the Solomons is divided between Malaita province, which is the most populous province of the Solomons, and Guadalcanal, Guadalcanal, where the capital is, and both parts of the Solomons, you know, one part is more pro-Taiwan, one part is more now pro, pro-China. So these riots are also part of that game, part of accusations of corruption and, you know, so on. I think there was a panic. I think, you know, Biden held a US Pacific Islands summit last year, the first such summit in Washington, D.C., Australia and New Zealand were concerned about being seen as dropping the ball. I think America probably admitted they dropped the ball too. America has a significant interest in Micronesia, which is the sub-region of Oceania in the north where Guam is, Mm -hmm. and where there is Micronesia and these states with a kind of compact of association with the U.S., and that is seen as part of the the power projection superhighway for the U.S. (laughs) Navy into whatever, East Asia, Southeast Asia, Indo-Pacific, and so on. And that Subregion is, you know, connected to Polynesia and to Melanesia, these two other regions that are nearer to New Zealand and Australia. So I think there was a panic. I think Australia, New Zealand, and US got together, said, hey, look, we, we need to nip this in the bud now. We don't want permanent Chinese naval bases in this region. We don't want China to be flanking the first and second island chains. We don't want Chinese submarines being able to pop up, and they already probably can, but they probably can't spend as much time in these regions without, regions without getting permanent bases. You know, we don't want a contingency over Taiwan where mm-hmm. Australia and US forces try to get there and suddenly Chinese naval fleets are coming out of the Solomons and submarines are popping up all around New Zealand and threatening Australia and New Zealand and so on. So I think there was a panic and there's been a rush of diplomatic attention to the region, of aid, investment, these security agreements. The U.S. just did a security agreement. In fact, two of them with Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea is the largest of these small states down there. Um, it has, I gather, some quite considerable natural resources too. So it may mm. be a bit like the U.S. looking around Central Europe and going, ha, Poland. Poland's our guy, right? They've got the potential. I think the U.S. looked at Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea is next to the Solomons and said, ah, Papua New Guinea. They're the ones we need to prioritize. They're the ones we need to do the agreement with and start to to build up, to balance any potential Chinese naval assets down here. There, there, of course, was the visit by Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister, for 10 days in the, to the South Pacific last year as well. That was basically a humiliation. Um, you might remember that, Jacob. You were, you were talking to your to the Australian gentleman at the time. And mm-hmm. what happened is there was meant to be this apparently regional agreement or agreement of 10 Pacific Island nations with China, a common development vision or what have you. When you turned up and that agreement was not signed, it was, I think, a bit of a humiliation. And we were all going, why wasn't this signed? Surely Chinese diplomats are not stupid enough to think they have this agreement, send off their foreign minister and he turns up and some of the countries there turn their backs on him. Mm-hmm. I suspect, suspect what happened is there was some loose agreement to sign it. He turned up, the Americans, Australians and Kiwis, or who knows who exactly, got into the ears of the Pacific Islanders and said, don't sign this, do not sign this. We have agreements in the pipeline, we have aid, we have investment, we have military cooperation. And, you know, this gave the Chinese a bit of a bloody nose. That, that's my yeah. suspicion there. Um, you're right that I, the resources in the South Pacific are also very interesting because Papua New Guinea has a lot of, you know, untapped resources. New Caledonia, major nickel deposits. If you start going down coal, copper, manganese, I mean, there's some very interesting resources in the region, which... Um, your, uh, your episode is going to appear right after an episode with Tomas, who's a metal and mining expert. And we talked about the reorganization of supply chains there. And I think that's one other way where the South Pacific actually can be relevant. Because from a geopolitical security perspective, I feel like the South Pacific is really only uh, 
relevant in the context of a war where in like in World War II, where the reason that Americans know the names of the, some of these islands that you've talked about is because if you've if you've studied any World War II history, you know Guadalcanal and some of these others mm-hmm. and kind of what that means. My grandfather, by the way, was in the South Pacific around that time. So um a so was bit mine. My mind fought in um Guadalcanal. Well, well, there you go. So maybe they were hanging out trying to record a podcast and they didn't have the the necessary <laughs> recording equipment somewhere in a sweltering jungle. But um, uh, one other question before we leave the South Pacific and talk about AUKUS and a couple other things. Um, I feel like the sleeping giant here that nobody ever talks about, and I'm, I've been guilty of this too, and I'm trying to correct myself. Um, and the Australian guest that you talked about, Rory, uh, he actually chastised me after we recorded the podcast. He said, you didn't ask me about this country. And it was honestly the most important thing you should have asked me about. And that is Indonesia. And I know that it's far away from New Zealand. I think it's like, what, an eight or nine hour flight, like just because distances are so large there. But it's not that far away from Australia. And Indonesia, when you start looking at scale, um, does seem like one of the natural powers. And if, if we really are moving multipolar, if there really are going to be more than two or max three sort of geopolitical centers of power, Indonesia is looking an awful lot like the country that actually can make moves here um, in the South Pacific. So talk to me about New Zealand's perspective of, of Indonesia. There are some people in New Zealand better placed to do this than I, because we don't, I don't hear much about Indonesia in the New Zealand media space. We do have institutes and institutions that are focused on ASEAN especially, and New Zealand's view is that we want ASEAN to retain some level of kind of centrality in the region. We don't want it to become a Cold War shatterbout again, mm-hmm. where it's divided and external powers are coming in and doing what they want and causing chaos and war and so on. But you know, geopolitically, Indonesia is fundamentally important, I think. And Indonesia, interestingly... I mean, it's foreign policy, different to New Zealand, but it maintains a bit of an independent approach to China, but like New Zealand does. And I think that's very pragmatic and smart re- reasons from their point of view. I would go back to the late 90s when you had the Asian financial crisis. There were real concerns in Australia especially, and what happens in Australia has sort of smaller resonances in New Zealand, that what if Indonesia comes apart? And suddenly you're dealing with this giant archipelago that's chaotic and who knows, maybe some hard man swoops in and tries to unify the nation and picks a fight with who? Well, Mm -hmm. who's logical? Australia and New Zealand. Australia and New Zealand fought alongside the British in the 60s against um, sort of Indonesia's quest for a greater Indonesia at the time. So maybe, you know, you you turn back the page to history and start to, to rally up the people in that way. That's me jumping through some levels of worst case thinking, though. And in Indonesia today is it's viewed as a pretty pragmatic re- uh, country in the region. Um, countries want to see it succeed, including New Zealand. It's it's a it's a source of trade. It's a source of students. Um, it it is the center of Asia, and all you know. Maybe someone will quibble with me about that, but it's the most significant nation of Asia. And so we want it to succeed. We want to cooperate with it. Um, see. No one has any reasonable critiques of Indonesia at this stage. Maybe some people about uh, it's the tra- trajectory of some of its politics, but I'm not expert enough to, to really wade into that. But, yeah. No, the, the, see fact, the fact that uh, it's not sort of further up even in New Zealand media makes me feel even more certain that I'm in the right place and trying to develop some expertise there. Um, let's yeah, let's turn away and let's talk about AUKUS. And maybe I'll just start with a an intentionally superficial but blunt question which is is new zealand going to join does new zealand want to join and maybe you should tell the listeners what AUKUS is and listeners if if you have a better acronym or name for these security agreements whether it's the quad or AUKUS, i'm here for all of your names i will use them on the podcast nobody else will but i hate these names and i'm i'm in the market for alternatives so let me know (laughs) um so just quickly on that important point I think, I wonder if orcas, it's a bit like orcas. Is that what they were going for? The whale? Uh, or is it I think just... you're, giving them, you're giving them way too much okay. credit. They have no, okay, okay. somebody was pushing okay. paper and was like, oh yeah, there's some letters that we're okay. going to arrange in an yeah, order. That's fair. Yeah, fair enough. I'm being too charitable. Um, yeah, so or- orcas is this trilateral security pact between the US, UK, and Australia. It has three pillars. The first pillar is to, over the coming decades, get nuclear-powered submarines into the Australian arsenal. That's going to be bridged by giving them Virginia-class submarines first and training the Australians on them and so on. But you're looking at a very long-term effort here. 
you know, two or three decades worth of work. And who knows, who knows if they ever actually get those nuclear powered submarines. If they even just get the Virginia ones, that will be seen as a major quiver in the mm. Australian Navy. And the Australian Navy wants that because they've shifted their grand strategy, if you will. Um, the submarines they were going to get before AUKUS from France were diesel powered submarines. They can just, they cannot patrol as long. They cannot patrol as far. The nuclear powered submarines will be able to spend months at sea. They will also be able to push up further north into where? The South China Sea. They will be able to join whatever, a blocking maneuver against China if that eventuates. They will be able to join a sort of US forward projection war plan. The diesel powered submarines, as I understand that, were more defensive, more about protecting the north of Australia rather than pushing forward um, further north into the South China Seas. The second pillar is to share the state of the art emerging technologies, right? Quantum computing, AI, undersea technology, hypersonic missiles, uh, information sharing, and you know, what have you, these great fourth industrial revolution kind of technologies that are just kind of emerging and finding their feet now. The third pillar is for uh, Australia to further rotate US forces through Australian territory, which was already happening, but I guess this is leveling it up a bit. And Australia is turning itself into a big aircraft carrier, continental-sized aircraft carrier for the <laughs> United States. Uh, Australians might not find that a charitable description, but I'm not Australian. Okay, so will New Zealand join? Do we want to join? So this has actually led to quite a debate. I got fed up because... The New Zealand media space, the commentariat, academics, former prime ministers, officials, everyone was completely anti-AUKUS. And earlier this year, uh, Kurt Campbell, Biden's Indo-Pacific Tsar, came mm-hmm. to Wellington and he basically, it looks to me like he offered uh, New Zealand to join Pillar 2. He said when New Zealand is comfortable in doing so. Okay, He's aware of New Zealand's domestic politics here. But the response was scathing, overwhelming. And I just thought, this is ridiculous. Like, even if we decide not to join, there should at least be some consideration of what the benefits could be or what the strategic implications are were New Zealand to join. So I started writing articles about this, putting it out (laughs) over the New Zealand media and so on. And it kicked up a bit of a ruckus. There were some, quite a few responses in the media. Some people joined my side. A lot of people didn't. I got some nasty emails by people saying oh, I'm a pro-US imperial warmonger and all this nonsense. <laughs> um, people sending me links to Guantanamo Bay and this. Thanks, guys. Yeah, great. You got me. Whatever. Um, so I actually wrote some rebuttals. And my case was like, okay, if no one's going to put forward the case, what is it? I kind of said, well, look, New Zealand, New Zealand's military always wants to remain interoperable with our Five Eyes partners. Okay? We talk about it all the time. Our strategic documents talking about it being a key objective. Well, it seems to me these Pillar 2 technologies could be pivotal in that in the future, instrumental. You know, if you don't get hold of them, maybe they'll be given to us, some people say. But, you know, if a lot of investment go into them, if these these are the critical military enablers of the future, is Australia and the US just going to give them to New Zealand, who wasn't willing to join the agreement when publicly it was offered? I'm I'm a bit sceptical. So it's about interoperability. It's about our future military doctrine. It's about this idea that, you know, maybe in the future... On the battlefield, there'll be a diff- the major difference will be between the best algorithm and the rest. Even small differences in advanced technologies could be decisive. Maybe five eyes intelligence sharing mechanisms are eventually upgraded based upon some of these technologies too. So New Zealand just de facto starts to slip out of five eyes because we cannot, you know, we our men and women cannot go into the skiff in Wellington and communicate with um, their peers abroad. Maybe economics too. Maybe there's industrial benefits here. I mean, one thing I think is being overlooked here is that there, you know, there are major impediments, export controls, industrial barriers in the US military industrial complex to um, other countries getting access to cooperating, collaborating, and selling into the US parts of the US military. I gather AUKUS is going to break down those barriers, that activity is already underway so Australia can get much more um, easier access to that. So maybe there is industrial benefits there potentially too. I think it's also about future-proofing access. I mean, technology, if we, if we are in this new neo-Cold War, to me so far, if the Americans are trying to create you know, economic blocks, exclusive economic blocks, they've failed in most respects, but where they're starting to have some successes in high technologies, right? Semiconductors, 
5G internet. I mean, New Zealand, most of the Western world, I think, was either encouraged or coerced by the US to not take Chinese 5G telecommunications. Mm -hmm. So these technologies, too, could play into that, too. With a a new great power competition, it is at this high end of technology where the US is able to force a kind of split and division in the world. And that maybe starts to get into kind of almost binary thinking. I mean, New Zealand doesn't want to have to 100% pick a side, right? Because that could have trade consequences for New Zealand. But it might be in this area of high technologies where we do have to pick a side. And in fact, I think on things like 5G, we are already picking a side, Jacob. And Pillar 2 is another part of that potential picking a side. And I'll say one other thing here. You know, some people are referring to AUKUS as the permanent alliance. You know, that the Americans have this big kind of global alliance system, if you will, but there's an inner circle of allies. And the closest allies are probably the UK and Australia, right? I mean, yes, you have the Europeans and NATO, but, you know, do they pull their weight? Will they be there outside of contingencies, unless that contingency is directly germane to them? Will they all, fall apart? All of, all, all, of, all of the Canadians listening just, just self-immolated, by the way, as you were talking, just letting you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, look, Canada is in the bag, okay? <laughs> Canada's in the bag. Um, in fact, I think she's the Deputy Prime Minister, Christian Freeland. Uh, she sh- has, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she has said that they're open to joining Pillar 2 of AUKUS as well. So again, there's a scenario here where the four of the five eyes are part of Pillar 2 AUKUS and New Zealand isn't. But again, we're kicking it down the road, kicking that can down the road. Um, the majority of the commentariat are against New Zealand joining. There was just a new article out today with some of New Zealand's academics speaking out against it. And I, look, I'm, I'll put the probability higher than people would expect. I reckon it's about 50-50. Mm. I think New Zealand's going to watch very closely how things evolve over the next six months. I think that could be pivotal into the decision New Zealand makes. If there is a kind of quiet or overt detente, maybe New Zealand then goes, maybe New Zealand reassures itself, ah, we're back to business, you know, back to the 1990s, globalization, liberalization, blah, blah, blah. And we convince ourselves that the great power competition is going to go away and we don't have to sign on to things like AUKUS. But, you know, there's a trend here and maybe come the next election, uh, we make the decision to enter AUKUS. I think it's about a coin flip. <laughs> Um, that's some of the best analysis I've heard about AUKUS so far. Um, before I let you go, um, I, I wanted to look back a little bit and ask, because um, I feel like Jacinda Ardern has become not, not a celebrity in, in other parts of the world, but she's definitely the best known New Zealand leader probably of the last 20 or 30 years. And I wonder from your perspective what her legacy is, if she has a foreign policy legacy or, or how, how you think she will be remembered sort of in the grand sweep of, of New Zealand's history. You could get me into trouble here, but great. It's okay. That's your job. Um, we might triple our New Zealand listener base, and I can uh, yeah. you guys can overtake Denmark. There you go. <laughs> um, I think the legacy will be actually complex. Let's start with foreign policy. I mean, there was already a trend line towards slightly no towards closer ties between New Zealand and the US that preceded Jacinda Ardern through the national government, our previous conservative government. That was sustained but not really demonstrably advanced. Now, we've got the P8, these Poseidons, okay? But, you know, negotiations and considerations for equipment like this go on for years, and I suspect it started under the previous government. Those Poseidons are significant because they're anti-submarine warfare Um, platforms. They can also conduct surveillance and so on, but they can also keep an eye on what's going on under the sea, and there's been a lot of talk of submarine activity in recent years, and that's what AUKUS is basically about, right? That's the top line part of AUKUS, the submarine capability. Those P8s are going to be talking to the American platforms and the Australian platforms, okay? They're going to be monitoring our EEZ. New Zealand has a massive exclusive economic zone that people don't know. And there will be submarines going through those EEZ. In fact, I've had more than one source tell me we, we likely have um, you know, submarines from nations that have different values and interests to us patrolling through New Zealand's EEZ. So you, you get into that great power competition aspect there as well. So consider, consider, she continued, I think, the, the incremental upgrade of New Zealand's ties to 
the US and so on. But if you go read her speeches, I mean, she really is holding out idealistic hope that, yes, the region's becoming more contentious and complex with elements of strategic competition, but she focused a lot on climate change as well. If you come to the mm-hmm. South Pacific, island nations, their major concern, their existential concern is climate change. You know, this strategic competition to them is, it's a distraction. It's something they don't really want. I mean, they'll take, some of them will take the benefits when they can get it, mm-hmm. but it is environmental factors, it's social factors, governance, economics. Those are their big issues. And climate change was a big part of Jacinda's kind of foreign policy approach. Uh, she actually announced, I think in 2018 or 19, that New Zealand would no longer be handing out permits for oil and gas exploration uh, in New Zealand's territory. So, you know, kind of some people were angry about that because it you know, will kill off sort of that exploration in time. I think it's about 30 years, but nonetheless, it's a signal to foreign investors, foreign companies that, hey, New Zealand is closing up business in that respect. Um, her response to the Christchurch, the terrorist attacks was, I don't know, her, it was overwhelmingly positive, I think. You know, she immediately went down to the Muslim community there. She was wearing the headscarf. She was showing an outpouring of emotion and empathy that I think most world leaders cannot um, cannot manage. <laughs> Politicians, you know, you get a bit sceptical that they, they these events are just instrumental for them. For her, she felt it. You could see she felt it. In fact, I think part of the reason she left is because she'd had probably quite a stressful time with all these events and issues. You then have COVID, right? We shut the borders pretty quickly. We were very successful. We, we were open internally while much of the world remained pretty much closed. And a lot of foreign... You know, foreign media leaders saw that and you know thought we were very successful at what we did. We were pretty decisive. And again, she she showed a lot of empathy. She talked about being kind. You know, there almost these ideological messages were constantly being dropped into the New Zealand media space. And I think in the world today, where it's pretty easy to be cynical about power and about leadership, the fact that she had this real human side to her, I think, was was a massive, um, unique part of her international image and, and in a way, her foreign policy. And, you know, she, she also talked about wanting to make sure that New Zealand continue to keep ties with the widest ar- array of partners, that irrespective of how bad this great power competition gets, in her mind, she wanted New Zealand to continue to have links and communication channels to the Chinese. So I think that's also part of the legacy. Um, domestically, her legacy is slightly contentious, and let's not go into that. But let's just say New Zealand has some structural problems that no one has really been able to make much headway on in, in years, if not decades. Um, you know, our infra- infrastructure is underinvested. We have a housing boom that is now, you know, prices are declining, but they're still pretty high. From, I think it was 2005 to 2016, we let in a million immigrants. So, you know, a population of 3.5 million with a new million new people taken in and the not the requisite, not the requisite in- infrastructure and investment to deal with that. That's mm. an underlying issue that I think really affects our domestic economics. Not so much our domestic identity. We haven't had that populist backlash to a really strong degree in New Zealand, but it puts pressure on the economy. Let's put it that way. It, it is it is a thing that affects people's lives. So on that front, I think her domestic legacy will be disputed, but on foreign policy, it is it'll be pretty positive. Uh, Ruben, I, this was worth the wait, and I hope uh, we, we won't let another year go by until we have you back on the podcast. But thanks for coming on and sharing some thoughts, and uh, we'll talk to you soon, okay? Yeah, cheers, Jacob. This is great. Thanks. Thank you so much for listening to the Cognitive Dissidents podcast brought to you by Cognitive Investments. If you are interested in learning more about Cognitive Investments, you can check us out online at cognitive.investments. That's cognitive.investments. Uh, you can also write to me directly if you want at jacob at cognitive.investments. Cheers, and we'll see you out there. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. This podcast may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-looking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance, and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur.